Hi, my name is Anthony Wong, a graduate of 1974. I run a company called Creative Eateries, managing a group of restaurants. Um, the last nine months, I have been. First of all, I want to um, congratulate you to be able to groom a thousand um, guppies, guppies of scholars over the last ten years, and, and I think that's really, really important because they they formed a new leadership for the. Future to come. By the way, just to add to you, my last batch of scholar HDB was a 206 batch. 70% are HDB. Okay. When I have two kids apply for a scholarship on me, I look at the education background, I look at the family background. If the guy is a nice bungalow, I don't want him. Why? Because first, he doesn't need a scholarship. Secondly, he will not be driven to succeed. When you do PhD study, you are a loner. There's no classmate, one professor. Well, everybody is after your same paper. If you don't have the drive to succeed, if you have poor, you have no choice. If you have well to do, you will keep quit. So I always favor the poor kid. Equal grades. Huh? If it's poor again, don't count. So up to my last batch of 70% HTB. That's very good. Excellent. Um, the last um, a year or so, I've been um, making a lot of frequent trips to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, through a lot of initiative with Spring mm -hmm. um, and um, um, uh, business of commerce and things like that, and I met with a lot of uh, officials who, who 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 gave presentation to us in China, and to my surprise, a lot of them are very young. They are all like in their late twenties, early thirties, very very well educated. Speaks, I mean, Mandarin is fluent, but actually can speak very good English. And uh, and I look at them and say, my gosh, these are the f these are the future generation of leaders of China, yep, yep. which is a huge domestic market. Mm -hmm. And for every idea that they implement, and within three years it can it can grow to a Big market. huge market. Whereas our graduates, uh, for every one idea they have to do, they have to try very hard to to break the market. Sure. How how can we ensure not not only your one thousand guppies plus that 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 10,000 smaller guppies from NTU and NUH that graduated every year to compete with this, this frightening group of graduates in, in China that's going to dominate the world market. And how do we make our young people get up our, from our comfort zone and, and to be integrated into the China economy, to be integrated into the Indian economy, and uh, to be part of them and discourage people to lower the grade of uh, Chinese waiting in schools because those are so much needed. How, how do you think our leaders can integrate into these two big economies in the future? Well, <clears throat> we don't have the one billion people. We are only four million people. So I used to say my scholar, one Singapore scholar, and he's a scholar, must be worth ten times a PRC scholar. We must be the extra better, whether it's Chinese, Singaporean, Indian, and Vietnamese, Malaysian. We must look for people who are the extra. And I believe of the thousand scholars, we have very good quality people. Whether the girl from Shanghai, the girl from Ipoh, the girl from Hong Kong, uh, Vijay from India, Fang from Vietnam, they are extra talent. The reason why I choose these young people, they set very high standards. And by the way, the students who come to Singapore find out about ASTAR, every year they must get perfect score. The year they don't make perfect score, I drop the scholarship. And these kids are poor, they will do it. Father, mother, policemen, they will definitely do it. They set high standards for our own Singapore kids. If we don't bring the bright, hungry kids to Singapore to be the standard bearer, our Singapore kids will slack. I have Kishore complain to me, you're a terrible fellow, you bring all these Vietnamese kids. My son complained. His son and daughter now in Yale is very happy. The day we stop, we think our standards have been reached, our goal has been reached, we are in trouble. We cannot compete with China. There's no way, we have no market. So we must be the extra best, better than that. Not easy. Secondly, we need not be restricted to China. There's India, there's Brazil, there's Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. There's, we must go further afield. I don't believe our fate is with China. Our key strength in Singapore is that we are English speaking, we are a diverse nation, we take people from everywhere. My officers are Indian, Vietnamese, doesn't mean. China is a single what I call community. They all speak Mandarin in China. The Chinese you meet who speak English are small groups. It's a single nation. Anyone who cannot speak Mandarin 
is treated as an outsider. Let's remember that. Fortunately, our young people can speak Mandarin. But there are other markets where our English is very strong. I go, I, in fact, most of my work is economic development. I do most of my work in the Middle East. I go to Brazil. I go to every other country. Four million people, let's say two and a half million Singaporean Chinese, cannot compete with 1.3 billion Chinese. Impossible. So we accept that we, our SMEs, must go to market much further. Further away. And our key strength is that we must take in our own SMEs, not just Singaporeans, people from different backgrounds. I, in fact, I visited a company last year, a Singapore engineering company. His number two, his CTO, is a Frenchman. He's been here for 14 years. He doesn't want to go home. There's a company called iGlobe, always helping. The number two to the CEO is a Singapore girl. It's a Frenchman, but spent many years in America. Singapore's strength versus China, I can take talent from anywhere in the world and make them feel at home. We are not a chauvinistic nation. We are English fluent. If you are not Mandarin fluent, go to China. If you are European, you are an outsider. You can't fit in. I go to Japan. A foreigner cannot exist in Japan because you don't speak Japanese. I go to Korea. You don't speak Korean. You are dead. Singapore's key strength is we must choose the best writers. My best proposal is bring them in young. You bring age of 15, they grow up to be Singaporeans. The Chinese girl speak perfect Singapore, but in fact, she, English is better. She hates Singlish. She thinks English is terrible. She listens to BBC. Her English is flawless. She reads Herodotus with me. She can discuss Herodotus. You know, Herodotus is written in 450 BC. Any English literature teacher. So she's not just an engineer. She's also intellectual and bright. We are able to attract that 20%, 30%, or 50%. I try to get more, but the limit is very costly. You know? If I give more foreign scholars... People complain, why are you are paying for it? No, but the foreign scholars, one in two foreign scholars have perfect score of 4.0. One in three Singaporeans have 4.0. The key factor between the Singapore student and the national student is hunger. Hunger is the strongest motivator. When we are poor, we have no choice but move up. If we are not a poor, we can offer, take it easy, relax. You know. The you poor girl, you should joke to me that her family are all girls. Her father is praying for a boy. She's still a girl. <laughs> but she's the smartest of the family. In fact, her father was hoping for a boy, and after that, I think they switched out, switched out of the factory. But she's the brightest of the family. She's, she's doing uh, uh, theoretical physics, Cornell 4.1 on PhD. She's the leader of the Singapore group. Perfect poise. She's a joke. If I say her father is appreciative. If you're born a boy, you may be not an A star scholar. Okay. What, what, do you say to the people people, drive. what do you say to the people who worry about the competition that comes yeah, yeah, yeah. No, competition is reality. We need to make sure our kids are hungry and driven. Yeah. And we should not restrict ourselves to China. I have a friend's son, one of my officers in EDB, she's a Malaysian. Her son went to Northwestern, actually graduated last year. Uh, he's just getting his uh, degree com- com- commencement in June. He's going to spend two years in Bangalore, working with Indian startup company, making products for premature babies. Premature babies. So you create a new material that wrap around the baby, keep the baby warm. Very bright kid, a mechanical engineer, Northwestern, which is in uh, Kellogg, Chicago, top school, working in India. So found a job with Indian company, two years. Meanwhile, he applied to Harvard Business School. He got a place for Harvard Business School in 2012. Because Harvard sounds is a very bright kid. Harvard makes sure that you have enough experience. So it's a true train. Northwestern, two years in Bangalore to Harvard Business School. He's working for what called social enterprise. Getting peanuts for us, but getting hell experience. Working in India, with a small group making products. So I tried to help him with WHO, how to apply WHO for funding to do this uh, premature baby uh, devices that he wants. Even if he fails, he learned to survive in India. Two years. Last week, his mother told me he down with diarrhea. I said, everybody goes in to get diarrhea anyway. <laughs> so he makes sure he has enough lomotil immodium. Now, if we have Singapore kids like this, I am assured that we will survive. There was a line in your, your remarks earlier where you said um, you wanted to imbue your scholars with a passion for Singapore. What did you mean by that and how do you do that? You see, many of our scholars here, we have now 50 PhD students at Stanford. Remember, I started in 2001, 
We have 45 PhD students at MIT, Cambridge Law School. How do you make sure that they come back? I have a bond. My bond is only five, six years. After the bond ends, who will stay? How many will stay? And the key is there is what I call it, the, the $64,000 question. Who has the passion to stay behind? Because these kids can go anywhere in the world. They are top schools. In Harvard, there are 24, 24 of them, I think. Because Harvard has a unique system. Every department in different form, so nobody wants to go there for the PhDs. And Harvard PhD program takes six, seven years. So these kids, this year now we have 24 kids. Okay? Last year's batch, a lot went to Harvard for PhD. Undergrad, we don't count. Undergrad, we care any school you go. But how many of these scholars will come back and will stay in Singapore and have bosses who will nurture and keep them? It takes two, you know. You must feel wanted. You must have environment supporting you or them to keep them here. And you must have an environment that promotes them up, moving up the ladder. If you keep them down, we can always get a ticket out and go anywhere. No problem. We possibly have the best kids, but the day we fail to keep them, it will lie not just their fault, but our fault. So we need to have students, Singapore young Singaporeans, who believe that this is their home. Okay. And for them to feel a home is you need to have an environment that's encouraging and supportive. Why do I build infrastructure? Because when I give a scholarship to scholars, I say, when you come home in 2010, 2011, 2012, this is a new working environment. I build ahead for them. Meanwhile, I bring senior people who start... Every scholar has a, has a mentor. Every senior scientist has up to five kids. They are mentored. Individually, every year they assess. They are not left on their own. In fact, they have, some of them have two mentors. First is a mentorship for the graduate studies. A mentor for undergrad. They're quite different. And for the graduate, look for someone whose work of interest to the student. When the student chooses their own mentor, by the way, they list the mentors. The student goes shopping. So the key for us is to find environment that keeps them here. Passion can be a call it, doused away, poured away, if the supportive environment is not there. Because no matter how much passion the kid wants to stay, we are not supportive, we are not encouraging. We don't do anything to give them space and, and freedom. They will not grow. They will not stay. Why did I stay in... I mean, I got Canada... I graduated in Canada in 1970. My born was five years. I disappeared in Toronto. Some of my classmates are there. Because I got a good boss and that gave me a lot of freedom will tolerate me, my, my uh, disasters. So if you don't have, when these young scholars come back and the future bosses are not support environment, physical environment, mental environment, managerial space, I think you will lose them. The key is, is the responsibility in keeping these scholars, keeping the young Singaporeans here lies with us. I mean, for them, they may want to come home and we want them to come home. But we must also make sure that we are responsible to make them feel wanted. If you are not wanted, you don't feel wanted, you don't blame them for not coming back. Can I just conclude? We're running out of time, but I just want to conclude. Can I take any more? One more last One student. One last question, Pat, the young there. man. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I'm Gerald Sung. I'm currently a student. Um, actually, so if, if it's okay, could I just make one clarification and after that ask one question? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so far, you have mentioned a lot of factors that we need to develop both our action um, in terms of creativity and what not to develop our youth in Singapore. However, I mean, you mentioned in the opening of your speech that for leadership, what is needed is both action and vision. So, I mean, one aspect of developing vision is in developing creativity, but are there any other ways in which Singap in Singapore we can develop our the vision as a youth? Because, I guess, yeah. <laughs> can you de define the question carefully? Any other ways we can develop creativity and the vision for well, Singapore? Creativity... Depending on the fight, the arts, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in that area. I think in Singapore, there's a lot of effort by governments to allow creativity, arts, performance, social arts, and all those things. I think it's important. Most of my focus is always on the industrial side. That's my strength. I know artists, no musician, but uh, my, my CEO, Tan Chinam, was with me. I sent him to create Mita. So a lot of people like us are also interested. But we are not trained to be artists. And the creativity of artists is different creative for a uh, technical engineering person. The technical engineering person is easier to define what you want to make, how to make it, and it's obvious. In performance arts, in music, it's quite different criteria. That's why it's, 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 there's no much uh, experience we have in that area. But the government has tried to find ways and means to support the non-social uh, non arts area. There's a lot of effort, but it takes time. But don't forget, it's, it's, it's a... It's an area that we have never excelled in. 
We started as a trading nation, trying to build an industrial nation, trying to develop an all around nation. It's a tough job. And this year is our Youth Olympics. Yes. Right? So, will we succeed? I don't know. It, it's not easy to, to be innovative or creative in every field. But we have noticed that when we have kids, for example, we participated in 208. You know, we have this robotics competition in America. They call it uh, like mice. Our Singapore kids, the family six kids and the poly kids, won the top prizes there. You know, innovative. They buy the Lego set, they make their own, they compete against all American kids. Are they not innovative? True, it's more technical. How many Singapore kids have become great performers, great musicians? I don't know. There are few. But it's an area that we are not. Now, the younger generation today are lucky. They are musical. My two kids play the piano. The young kids today. In my generation, there's no much performance arts. No, no. Uh, I don't think I ever saw a piano in SGI. <laughs> Maybe you have today. Yes. So, a different society. Your generation may be luckier. Hopefully, uh, uh, in our society, in my generation, is do well, get a job. Your generation doesn't have that pressure. So you have more freedom. If you want to do something else, I think your parents are much more supportive. So which means your room to... I mean, I know now of Singapore kids who finish NUS, NTU and take a break, travel around the world. When I graduated from Toronto, May 19, I flew home on 22nd. and 26th, I started work. <laughs> I finished my Harvard Business School on May 17, 18. I came back one week later, I started work. Holiday, you're kidding. That was the way we were used to it. Today, our young kids, NUS, NTU, take holiday to travel around the world before they start work. Hopefully, we are more liberal and hopefully, our young generation has more space to be more than creative in the way we are doing. Maybe we can do it. All right, thank you, sir. Huh? Um, okay. Could I also ask? I think Singapore has done very well with our meritocratic system in that we have been well able to develop all aspects of our talent. However, I think there's been quite a lot of recent debate about our education not just catering and talent development for the best able, but also to bring it down a level so that we have equal opportunities for all and to, rather, and to set our standards of education or our focus of education at, the, at a lower standard so that we can cater to more um, areas of the population. So would you think that there's a conflict there between talent development and equal opportunity? And if so, how can that be resolved so that we can continue to breed our little guppies, as you I mentioned? I think the Minister of Education, he mentioned something two weeks ago, I was travelling. And he made a point that you need to be more diverse, more flexible. The, the key in any student population, let's say there are 100. The average good student have no problem. You are able to cope with classwork. The top 20% will die of boredom because the work is too slow for him. The other 5 percent will find it hard to catch up. The key is how to take care of both ends. How to keep the interest and motivation of the very bright kids, but yet not hold them, yet at the same time not neglect the weaker students. And that is a challenge for good education. We have succeeded today because we are very good at teaching the average student and all do well. By the way, every year 12,000 students do A-level, 4,000 have four A's, you know. I know because I look at our statistics. And out of the 4,000 I choose 400 with 4A plus to choose a scholar. So some Singaporean kids are not. So it means our average education state is good. But the very bright one, the weaker ones, we have to take care. So that is the challenge of ministry education that we need to uplift everybody. If I have a choice, I put all my emphasis on primary school. Primary school is the most important, or even kindergarten. Primary school is the kid's most formative years. When a kid has the best support, the best education teachers, support the environment, by the time the second one, you really don't need a teacher. At 15 years old, you should be self-independent. Maybe a teacher as a guide. It's the formative years of primary school and pre-primary school that's most important, which possibly in ministry education is now trying to pay attention. In fact, when Taman was a minister, I used to tell him, we should focus on primary school. Primary school is a key where the gap will be. When a child doesn't make primary school, primary six well, sec one, sec two, sec three is all uphill. If the guy cannot run at the plateau, how can he run up the hill? So I think the government is trying to realize that that's first uplift everybody. Secondly, is also allow this starting. I mean, if I have the best teachers, I'll put them in the primary school. Put them in the weakest school. If you're an RI, 
RI top student. You really don't need a teacher. You should be able to self-study. When I was in JC, my maths teacher was very good, Mr. Chua. Chua moved on. I used to do my maths on my own. Three months, I had a game in the paper, then I go to the library and sit down. He was very tolerant. I handed my notes, my maths. You take my notes and teach the class. I just go to the library, read my own things. To me, I was getting bored, and some of my classmates were equally bored. So those of us who are good, we finish, and we go to the library, tolerate. Okay, those who think they're done, homework can go. So we all went to the library, sit down there, read our own books. And they use our notes to teach the rest. We are teachers allow that. Because Sorry. the problem is that the kids were very bright, very bored. And that's the most difficult. The teachers do not like students who cannot sit still. <laughs> right? The kids who cannot sit still are the kids who are likely to do better because he's bored. The kids who can sit still, that's not the problem. It's the kids who can't sit still and the kids who are left behind are the problem of our society. Can I, can I just bring you back just to conclude? Um, you ended your remarks by bringing yourself back to the school. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about what happened in SGI that made you the person you are? I think well, I, I mentioned earlier in SGI in our school, in my era, of set one to pre-U, we called pre-U in those days. We, had, we remained almost the same class, same bunch of people all the years, almost through train. We didn't change class. So some of us moved in, moved out, but the class did not move every... Uh, change teachers, literally the teachers more or less stay with the same class. And we have students who are weaker, we help sit down and help me to do a match, make sure you pass. So a lot of that was more or less the value system. Uh, those who did were now crow, were crowing around. There was no price for top students anyway, no price. I don't remember any prices. That was it. That was the system. So the key is make sure the whole class do well. Quite, uh, there's a lot of emphasis today that I mean, you want to reward the top student, but you want to use them as standard to raise the standard. You don't want the top student to say, look, you can do it, the rest are all stupid. That's the worst you can do. So in SGI, our system was, okay, the, the good kids help the weaker ones, that was it. There's so no, no key. Uh, it was done as like, for normal. So that, the way we did, and we all did well. I remember we had a terrible chemistry teacher in pre-U1, uh, and the teacher was always disappeared. So I called my classmates, there were 11 hours, 12 hours, 2 hours in science. I said, we better do something. First, in SGI my time, if there's no teacher in the chemistry lab, nobody can go in. He had the key. So what do you do? So I told my class, let's form our own chemistry lab. So my auntie had a house in Beach Road. When my auntie's house up thick, it's attic. So I said, we better build our own chemistry lab. How do you build chemistry lab? You no money. I said, we went to my vice principal, brother Christopher Chen. Brother Christopher, I was in charge of audio visual, so I did a projector. Like movies for the schools. So I went to Father Christopher, can I borrow a movie projector to run movies on Saturday and Sundays? Why do you need the money? I need to build my own chemistry lab. So Guan Ching, myself, all of our classmates, there were 10 of us. There were 10 of us, 11 of us. We built our own chemistry lab by hiring movies from KT. The first movie I ran was called Run Silent, Run Deep. <laughs> World War II summary. I bought, hired a firm for $25 a whole day. In one day, I sold $125 tickets. So the whole chemistry lab was funded by us. When I finished my pre uh, by the way, Gong Ching got perfect scores for chemistry. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was good at maths and physics. I hate chemistry. Uh, but I built a chemistry lab, and all of us, and we went to Chinatown. There was a shop called, uh, I forgot the name. They sell all the chemistry. Acids, pure acid, pure nitric, pure sulfate. And we carry the acids on bicycles. So my classmate, Kok Siu, was one of them, one chick. So right to my auntie's house, because we were not staying there. She gave a tick. We built a whole chemistry, the keep separators, everything. Because it was a bomb. All funded from running movies, selling tickets to SGI, to CHIJ girls, anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we found out that we didn't get money from parents. But very Christopher, very, very tolerant. Right? Sign, right? Okay, you can use it. Uh, I need to buy chemicals. He signed for us. What Dr. Chris, Barry Christopher didn't know was buying pure acid. I said, I need to buy chemicals. I said, I said, Barry Christopher was vice principal. We bought acids from, from a chemistry shop in Chinatown. Pure acids. Everything needed. And built all chemistry. We got the permission to run movie projector, run movies, sell tickets. That was the way we are very tolerant vice principal. Uh, our chemistry teachers forever disappeared. I don't know what's the reason. <laughs> uh, and out of 22 classmates, 11 hours got Colombo Plan scholarships. 
50% yield. Not bad. And notwithstanding that, uh, we got a lousy chemistry teacher. I would say well, quite a lot of us have got A's. Uh, especially once you got A's in every chemistry. It's very good chemistry. Yeah. So that was the way we are. Teachers were tolerant. Vice principal were very tolerant. He never knew what, what we were carrying around. It was pure acid, big, big bottles. Uh, pure acid on bicycles. We didn't know the danger. I only knew the danger one day when a bottle of nitric acid fell from the table, burned through my SGI white pants. I think the cotton was quite thick, so I survived. There was a little patch. It was pure acid. <laughs> then I realized how dangerous the acid was. When it poured down on you, nitric acid really burns, you know. So there's only, oh, this is serious. And we told everyone, <laughs> Because in a lab, we use small quantities. When a whole bottle pours on you, on those uh, glass bottles, and the SGI white pen saved, uh, saved my skin. Saved by the uniform. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good place to end. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Philip. We'll continue the discussion over uh, drinks upstairs. Sure, sure. I think everything that Philip has said and done throughout his life and career can be summed up in the, the memorable phrase from John F. Kennedy that one man can make a difference and everyone should try. So please join me in thanking Philip Yo for the opportunity.